character occupy 90% of your mind? Do you ever see people talk about that said character and realize they just don't understand them at all? Now, I can't lie, some people who are the latter can be a little pretentious sometimes. Someone who claims they know a character in media better than you do probably has an even worse take in store. However, despite this, I honestly believe Benjamin isn't given enough recognition as a character at all, despite how impactful he truly was. Oftentimes, he's overshadowed by the more recognizable of his trio, whether it be Ian or Carmen. If not, he's reduced to one or two jokes and written off as a character that's practically for comedic value. Therefore, I had the bright idea to condense every thought I had floating around in my rotting brain into this amalgamation of a persuasive essay. My only goal is to make Benjamin's story a little clearer and outline his character arc. Throughout both games, he is an underrated gem in the goldmine that is Project Moon's character writing. To do this, I'm going to start from the beginning and go from there, covering how Benjamin started out and the person he ended up becoming. I hope you enjoy it, and I hope this changes your or anyone else's perspective on his character. The earliest info that we know about Benjamin before he was involved in with Carmen's project to cure the city is only that he was a nest resident, much like I am and Carmen. Although it's not explicitly stated, we can infer he comes from a background of high education, which is likely the environment in which he met Ian. Ian at the time would have already been sold on Carmen and her plan to save the minds of the city's residents. He would then go on to spread the word to his academic colleague, convincing Benjamin to join their small but ambitious team. This would make him the first person to do so, solidifying his spot in the iconic trio early on. However, convincing is a curious word to use in this particular situation. By all means, Ian was not the social miracle worker like Carmen was. He didn't have the same gift with words that she had. He couldn't sway people with long-winded speeches or convince even the most skeptical to join him in his cause. There are several moments in the narrative which hint at Ian being Carmen's opposite that provide only further evidence to this. But in Hakma's second episode, he states that most others followed Carmen, but I was loyal to another person, a man named Ian. So why was Benjamin so eager to join him, and how did Ian become such a central part of his life instead of Carmen, the woman everyone seemed to flock to? The answer, as many may have pointed out already, is that it was most likely love, but not in the way you'd think. Now, I'm going to put a pause on this for a moment to explain exactly what I mean by that. If you read any of Benjamin's dialogues regarding Ian already, it's pretty easy to agree that there's some sort of underlying romantic tone in much of his words, whether it be his first few lines of, I missed you dearly, I've been waiting for you ever since I started working here, or other lines such as, may we be together and fade away together. However, let's drop the shipping goggles for a moment and look at this romantic infatuation from another angle. See it for what it more closely resembles, a lost, aimless man's need for purpose in life, found in his ambitious and bright colleague giving him the time of day, who he subsequently idolizes. Is it really far-fetched to assume that Benjamin was also one of the many who suffered from what Carmen called the pain and agonies of the nest, as seen in Gebero's fourth episode? There's no mention of Benjamin joining any wing, despite clearly having the education skills to do so. Later on, he says himself that, back then were the brightest moments of my life, in Dialogue 1, referring to his time working with Ian. If being taken as an apprentice of who he calls the greatest architect he's ever met was the highlight of his entire life, it says much about the quality of his life beforehand. It's why we can see this idolization morph into a sort of genuine, romantic love for Ian over time, as he was the only man who gave him a purpose and took him under his wing, even if the love was one-sided at most, if not all times. However, the fact that their relationship was built off this unstable foundation from the beginning is one of the factors that I believe is the most impactful about Benjamin's character and his relationship with Ian. In short, because of the way one's personality and actions would only feed into the other's personal vicious cycle, it only meant that the closer they became, the more they would hurt each other. But at if one point they only had one another, what would become of them? A little further down the line, the question of their relationship that was destined to fail will be answered. For now, back to Benjamin himself. At this period in his life, he's in the honeymoon phase of this ambitious research project. Ian's words only egg on his hope for the future, and every passing day he enthusiastically learns under his new mentor. With his skills, he assists this group, watching the plan slowly come to fruition as more and more people join the project. However, despite the faint hierarchy of Ian, Benjamin, and Carmen that forms, as they are the original three, Benjamin is not the driving force of the project. At this moment, he's only a quiet assistant under his mentor's will, with Ian and Carmen being the leading pillars of the research. 
Nonetheless, his initial timid, iron-following nature makes his subsequent drastic change under the events that follow all the more important to his character. The main reason that inspired me to make this video was seeing countless interpretations of his character stop at who he was in the beginning, a hopeless, one-track-minded iron follower. However, the following events in the story that flip everything on its head show who he really is as an individual, and how he's one of the most mentally resilient and persistent characters in this game. When Enoch's experiment fails and Carmen ends up committing, Benjamin does not only lose one coworker close to him, but he loses two simultaneously. Ian completely spirals into a deep depression beyond saving, now burdened with the duty of carrying out Carmen's plan. Alongside this, Benjamin is desperately doing everything in his power to ensure that the person that he loves keeps going. Although not as desperately attached to Carmen as Ian was, he can only watch as Ian goes to the lengths of locking her in cryostasis, a feeble attempt at saving Carmen's life. Back then, you simply could not let Carmen go, he says in his fourth story. You were so desperate to keep Carmen on your side that you locked her in a cryostasis pod in an attempt to preserve her body at the very least. But during all this, you were perfectly aware that Carmen's body had become nothing but a shell. Benjamin doesn't want to do this. He knows she's beyond saving, but what else can he do? If Ian wasn't immersed in the illusion that he was doing something to further their plan, he'd just plummet straight into the deep end, likely joining Carmen. His only option is to further enable his actions, aiding in the mutilation of Carmen's body to extract her nervous system. He further proves his own motivation to go along with Ayn's desperation, saying he was rather relieved when he began to create Angela soon after, noting that he had something to be immersed in once more. Yet, as this is going on, Benjamin still has an entire research team to help lead. But with Carmen gone, Ayn, now leading the project, becomes more and more reckless. After Carmen's death, Ian does not stop Elijah from taking an unauthorized dose of Cogito, merely ignoring her and leading to her death. This leads to Gabriel's breakdown and eventual death, in which Benjamin played a part in his procedure, seen on the left in Yasad's fifth dialogue. Ian later then tests Cogito on Giovanni, who dies as well. What's interesting about this is that in Netzak's fifth dialogue, Ian says it was he who asked for volunteers, it was he who tried persuading people into the trials. The only time he references we, as in him and Benjamin, is when he says that they persistently began to research Cogito. This shows us how Benjamin was just desperately going along with his mentor's actions against the rest of the research team. He can only stand on the sidelines as these feelings of begging him to stop his reckless actions build up. However, there's still one thing that stops him from doing so just yet. His hope in Ian and his love for Ian. After Giovanni's death, Michelle snitches to the head about their research lab and kills herself after hearing the carnage that she directly caused. When Garyon attacks the lab, it's a complete tragedy. Everyone is killed, but Callie fatally wounds Garyon in the process, both saying Ian and Benjamin and leaving Garyon barely alive, seen in Gebra's fifth dialogue. Benjamin then helps Ian take Garyon's body, which leads to the two of them to probe her brain for vital information. They learn how to avoid the head for the time being, through becoming a wing. There's no sweet taste of victory or feeling of accomplishment. It's a move out of complete desperation, clawing through the horrific ordeals that have struck them. Like Ian says in a flashback covered in Bina's fifth story, we were too far down the road to fill with remorse and regret to feel any sort of guilt. This acquisition of this information builds up to the smoke war. Ian and Benjamin's plan to replace the old L Corp is put into motion, which is almost completely orchestrated by Benjamin. In Chapter 37 in Distortion Detective, we see a flashback from this time period in which Benjamin joins forces with Diaz, leader of the Ujats, to carry out the war. What I find most interesting is that Benjamin is the only one present at this crucial negotiation. When the noise in this chapter is removed, we can see the line that Benjamin says is, This must be done for the sake of all of us. For you, and for my mentor. He clearly states that he is only doing this for Ian and not for any personal gain. Benjamin can only hope that becoming a wing will save this broken man from himself. He knows that if Ian's goals are not fulfilled, he'll lose the only person he loves and be left completely alone. The unfortunate reality is that fear is not far from where he stands at this moment. Ian has spiraled long ago, channeling his sorrow into the creation of Angela and hanging on only because of his duty to fulfill Carmen's plan. And although I believe Ian did play some part in the smoke war, in the end, he was more occupied with his own grief. Now, 
it's a little unclear when, specifically, Angela is completed, but because of a couple of factors such as the mention of Callie and Daniel's death, we can assume that it's on the cusp of their victory in the smoke war, right before the two of them rise to a wing. But, in reality, it's anything but a good thing. All Benjamin can see is the product of Ian's immeasurable grief. He can only watch in pity-laced apathy as Ian stands completely still in the doorway of Angela's room. I remember you were just staring through the laboratory's glass, not setting a single foot inside, he recounts in Hakama's fourth dialogue. You might have thought that you noticed me right away. However, I witnessed you standing there for a long time before you realized I was there. What inner conflict made you hesitate so? I told you in so many words that no matter how many AIs such as Angela you create, none of them will ever be Carmen. Benjamin is at his wit's end. He's no longer blindly going along with everything Ian does. He's begging him, trying to reason with him, through every rash decision he makes. Benjamin is no longer just a simple student. If anything, he's the only voice of reason Ian has, barely keeping him from completely losing his mind. This is where that doomed relationship I talked about early on in the video comes back. They only have each other now. Benjamin is forced into the skewed role of a caretaker, enduring the collateral damage Ian causes. And slowly, ever so slowly, despite how much Benjamin truly loves this man no matter how broken he is, his once perfect image of Ian begins to crumble. If there is one thing I may have mistaken myself over, he says in his fourth dialogue, it is that I thought you overcame everything. The truth is that you never have. Doubt has already started to fill Benjamin's mind. In truth, it's been building up for years, and a particular collection of papers that Ian hands to Angela the day she's born is the tipping point. The script meant to bring their research, now the Seed of Light project, to fruition is finalized at this moment. It's a little unclear how long ago the script was being worked on, and who exactly helped write it other than Ian, but one thing is true. It terrifies Benjamin. He says nothing as he watches Angela read out what she must do. And at the 11th hour, Benjamin shows a last-ditch effort to save Ian, to save the person he cares so dearly about before he embarks on the most self-destructive plan yet. His last words to Ian are as follows, condemning the script and practically begging him. How can this still be considered following her will? This, this is nothing but a seed of calamity, drenched in sin. Oh, by the wings. Your mind has been soaked with grief even more severely than I thought. Please, just, why can't you stop now? You and I, we tried our best. With your career and wealth, you'll be able to live the rest of your life in the nest with no problem whatsoever. So please, I urge you, stop here. Stop before you cross the line. Ian does not stop, which leads to the most painful decision that Benjamin subsequently makes. He runs away. This is a crucial moment in Benjamin's storyline. Ian's refusal to back down shatters his heart, forcing it to come to this breaking point as Ian doesn't listen to Benjamin again, again, and again. Everything he worked for, everything that he aspired to see by Ian's side, it was all for nothing. Benjamin can't be there for him anymore. And yet, even though Ian eventually expresses how much Benjamin means to him, it's far too late. When Ian establishes his new wing, built on the blood, sweat, and tears of his late colleagues, Benjamin is nowhere to be found. The man who had always been with him. The only man who could bear to love him almost unconditionally like he did. In Hakma's sixth dialogue, he says, You were always so frugal with words. I could have no idea what you exactly attempted to achieve by creating this prison. The process of creation was too harsh. I could not help but run away. But only a single line later, he says, I could have run far enough that I would never see you again, but I did not. Benjamin never truly left. He doesn't have it in him to completely leave Ian behind, despite it being in his power to sever all ties he had with his mentor. He hides in Ian's office at the bottom of the facility when the script is set into motion in the hopes of setting things right. However, there's one crucial detail about Benjamin and his involvement in the endless time loops of the facility. He keeps all of his memories, not getting them wiped after every reset like the Sephira. He remembers every single repetition in what went wrong to trigger its reset. He watches the person, who was once his great mentor, get reduced to a shell of who he once was. The Ion managing the facility over and over again is not the same Ion that Benjamin parted ways with. However, that does not stop Benjamin from trying to save him and break the cycle. Through every repeat, he contacts this quote-unquote new manager, who he knows is simply this fragment of Ion with wiped memories, X. 
His messages are sporadic, but in every loop without fail, Benjamin contacts the manager three times on three separate days in the facility. The first contact Benjamin makes with X is on the 11th day. The message is brief. Benjamin introduces himself as B, an insider, saying that he cannot reveal his identity. He promises that soon he will tell X three truths about the company. On the 13th day, Benjamin delivers the first truth, warning against Angela. He confesses having aided in her programming, although he never specifically mentions her name, choosing to be ambiguous, and lets X know that she has the capability to lie. Later on in the conversation, he gives X a one-time use lie detector to be used against Angela. He can only hope that these seeds of skepticism planted in X early on will protect him. On the 16th day, Benjamin delivers the second truth. How much do you know about the company? Benjamin asks X. I have met many a manager in my time. I have seen how the company exploited them. Did they tell you that you're special? Pulling the wool over your eyes, filling your ears with lies, saying that you're remarkable and resourceful, and that is why you were hired? Don't trust the company. In these first lines, Benjamin confesses to having seen the countless repeats of X as the scenario restarts, watching him struggle and fail over and over again. He warns against putting any trust in the entire company itself, as he knows everything is just a tool for the script. However, later in the conversation, Benjamin briefly references this. Of course, every wing is more than they appear to be, he adds. However, this company runs much deeper than one might expect. There was a time where everyone worked hard for the same goal, but we lost integrity along the way, and things went downhill from there. Benjamin mentions the research team that he and Ayn once held, looking back on their downfall and Ayn's actions. This is all brought up to X, who doesn't know that he put him and Benjamin in the situation they stand in at this moment. Benjamin understands this. He can't blame X, no matter how much he wants to. On the 18th day, Benjamin delivers the third and final truth. I understand that the truth hurts, he says. It's, it's hard for me as well. It feels like building up a sandcastle for years, only to kick it over once it's done. Doing something like that is beyond agony, to deny the efforts of the past. But I want to make things right, no matter the cost. The final truth is... He's cut off. The remainder of the message is only heard on the 47th day, in which Abel shares a recording of Benjamin's final moments. You haven't witnessed it, Abel almost mocks X. The way our old friend Benjamin met his demise, he was one of the few who could tolerate your ill-temperedness, yet you did not care to witness his final moments. Fortunately, we have a recording of it, as with every little thing that has happened in this facility. Would you like to give it a listen? X has no say in this as the recording begins to play, resuming the message that played 29 days ago. The final truth is... Angela quickly cuts Benjamin off, repeating the words she's heard from him thousands of times before that you are about to begin the repetition of this infinite cycle, with your memories reset, oblivious to everything that has transpired. Leave with me before you can no longer undo what you set in motion. That's what you wanted to say. Benjamin wanted to run away with Ian. He could have done so by himself all those years ago, but he couldn't. He was missing his other half and would do anything in his power to pull him from their own creation, the sandcastle they built together for years. Benjamin is already in too deep, his desperate attachment to Ian is what leads to his own death, as we see in the rest of the recording. I'm sorry we have to meet again like this, Angela says. It did not take very long to find out where you were hiding. I thought I should have given you some time to say goodbye, since this will be the last chance you have to say such a thing to the one you look up to. Later, it may sound like an excuse, but please know this. I am not doing this out of personal feelings or malice. My every action is set by his first order, the absolute order that dictates not us, not to deviate from the script. These are not Angela's actions, these are Ian's. Penned in the script for what seems like an eternity ago, Benjamin was always meant to meet such a fate. Angela's only carrying out what her creator, Ian, ordered. Don't be afraid, Benjamin, Angela seems to falsely comfort him. Everyone you've missed and longed to see again is waiting for you. You shall be with them forever, because you are the last actor, the one who will lead this play to its finale. Right after this exchange, Benjamin is killed and turned to a Sephira, Hakma. In reality, this very conversation, and Benjamin's murder, has repeated itself thousands of times. Because of the Seed of Light system which automatically restarts the cycle once there's an error, Benjamin cannot say anything that will actually cause X to deviate from the script. This is why he shares the same message in every loop. It's the bare minimum that he can get across to him in hopes of a better result. Which means the exact same events play out. 
To keep the scenario going, Angela is forced to kill Benjamin every single time he reaches the third message. The absolute order not to deviate from the script. The very script which designates Benjamin as the one who will conclude the play. The one who will lead this shell of a mentor to a finale he is not even alive to see. After the 18th day, Benjamin is now turned into Hakma. The very first time he sees Ayan face to face ever since he ran away is a crushing, melancholic reunion. When Hakma meets X, he greets him as A, even though he knows very well that the man before him is not the man he calls by name. The cognition filter initially reflects a happy memory. A young Benjamin stands on the beach he and Ayan once stood on when times were simpler. Do you remember this ocean? He asks, knowing that X does not. You said that this place is where everything, from all rivers and streams, will eventually settle. After he says this, the filter melts away, revealing the ugly truth. I figured that what you long to see may have been something else than what I have become now. Time is like a scythe. It relentlessly attempts to trim, divide, and cleave in twain the clasped together hands of those you love. This very quote describes the person that he has come to be. His hands are desperately clutching Ions through every repeat, despite the fact that he's no longer there. Time has made Ion an empty husk. This he acknowledges in his next few words. Everyone I have loved is now gone, leaving me a tired old man behind. Please do not blame yourself. Hakma is completely alone. He doesn't have the luxury of having his memories wiped like X, which means that he is the only one burdened with the knowledge of the pain and suffering that he and Ion personally went through. Yet, despite this, Hakma cannot help but talk to X as if he were talking to Ion. He ends their very first interaction with, The only thing I regret to this day is that I was too scared. I ran away without keeping my abiding promise to you till the very end. However, you eventually found me and helped me to fulfill my promise here. How can I be ever more thankful than I am right now? You're just too kind to me, kind to the very end. He's given up on his effort to save Ion. He's learned that he's helpless. There's nothing he can do but follow the script his mentor wrote, the promise he needs to fulfill. It is here, where Hakma is at his most vulnerable, that he totally doubts himself. He was the misguided one all along. Ayan was right this entire time. Ayan has always been right. The second time X meets with Hakma, he continues to talk to him as if he had the same memories as Ayan. Are we managing to get closer to our goal? Hakma then asks X, referring to the germination of the Seed of Light. On the contrary to what people say, it appears that aging does not necessarily bring greater wisdom. Just look at this old man, going through what feels like an endless cycle of intermittent greed, the obsession over things that have passed, pointless regret. Now trapped in a routine of staring at the iron hands of time without reason, Hakma is drowning in his past. He knows his regrets of what he should have done are pointless now that he's trapped in this prison, but he cannot help but suffer. Putting his grievances aside, he then elaborates on how it is in his power to reverse people's death or leave them to die forever. But he only says this to explain how insignificant it is and warning that X should not punish himself over their deaths, for he does not wish to see him suffer like he has so many times before. The third time the two meet, he gives his insight on Ayan's past and the downfall of the research team they once had all those years ago. Pain, agony, regret, and the shadows of the past that would never release their grip on you. They've spent quite a number of days with you, but it is nothing compared to our time together. In the end, they never got to know you to the fullest. Those who could not accept their fate seem to have directed their anger towards you. Everyone Hakma references here has every right to blame Ayan for a multitude of things. However, with the way Hakma sees Ayan now, he believes that their anger was illogical. But not only does he defend Ayan's actions against others, he tricks himself into believing that all the horrific things that Ayan put him through were justified. Because of this reasoning of fate, Hakma further feeds into his own delusion of who Ayan was. Hakma continues to defend his point by exposing the means of which employees are hired, then orders X to erase one, proving it's meaningless. Everything that moves and is alive in this facility is on pause, Hakma explains. They await the next morning with their eyes shut tight every night. Those of the layers above did not know that. They spent themselves emotionally for the death with which they were presented. Bearing obscure resentments in their hearts, they put all the blame on those like you. Then they crumbled, just like that. I urge you not to worry about me. I will not dare do such a thing. I have always wanted to be an important part of your life. He trivializes the grievances of the upper layers once again and promises X that he would never stoop so low as to blame him for anything he's done. 
However, with that final phrase, the sliver of doubt Hakma once held towards Ayn as Benjamin begins to reveal itself. He always wanted to be an important part of Ayn's life. He never has been in the first place. The fourth time they meet, Hakma recounts Ayn's struggle of building Angela, as covered earlier in this video. Nonetheless, this anger and doubt from the past begins to resurface and finally boils over in their fifth meeting. Right off the bat, Hakma forces X to watch a brief moment of the past, only for it to be cut off by Angela. The moments I had just made you witness are no longer merely scenes of the past, Hakma tells X. They could be the present, or even from the future. There are people who once loved you, and there are employees who think they are happy here. There is also Angela, a cold imitation of Carmen. Is this not the heaven that has burrowed into your mind, the place you have been yearning for? In this place, you are no less mighty than God. Even death finds no meaning here. So I plead with you, will you not be satisfied already? We are so desperately continuing to exist, even if it means living like we are right now. What right do you have to turn everything to ash? As the conversation goes on, Hakma starts to resemble the old Benjamin and all the doubts he held towards Ayan before he left. He continues this, saying, Furthermore, it is clear that the story has no need for an end. Think about it. All the work you have done, is it truly a consequence of your own choices? You never were ready. You were not prepared to accept her death, so you created a being wholly shrouded in a sense of loss. And now, you are just struggling to move forward, blindly fumbling along the obscure trails of your past deeds. Throughout this entire process, you were never sincerely willing to do what you did. So please, I begged you to go back now. Hakma finally acknowledges that Ayan, X, and the entire facility is a pitiful mockery of what Carmen's plan once was. He knows that there's no point to ending this endless play, so he begs X to turn back and stop chasing the delusional prospect of a finale. But X does not yield. Look at you. You are proving me right. Hakma, for the first time, talks to X as an equal, if not beneath him, calling him out on his actions. You are not at all honest with yourself, even the gravest of choices you must make. Even if I were to send you away, you would likely return to me after having yet another fresh start. It is an uncontrollable law of this place we must follow. The whole facility has become one giant, ever-running clockwork. The clock never stops ticking. It never rests, it never rushes. It is not set to follow any specific person. It simply walks forever, maintaining the same pace it always has. And now, it is time for you to leave. Hakma believes that it is the facility's fate to stay in the loop forever. He knows that X will come back no matter what he does, but as long as he keeps X from clawing to the finish, the law of the facility is maintained. Change terrifies Hakma, which is why, when X once again refuses to stop, he snaps. You are a lost traveler without a compass or map, Hakma berates X. It is natural to feel fear when one is subject to the whims of the air and the sea. However, there is no need for you to fear the counting of the clock anymore. I shall always welcome you. I will always console you. You will never were ready. Hakma has found his home in this purgatory. As long as nothing changes, he'll live with his beloved mentor to the end of time. He wants to keep everything just as it is. He wants to relish in the stability and monotony of his life, where his loved one will forever be at his side. But X does not stop. Just like an eternity ago, when young Benjamin once begged Ayn to turn back, X stubbornly keeps going. You have not changed your decision in the end. It had seemed that tomorrow would have come as it always does, but it has not. The hour of silent waiting has long since ended. When I no longer feared the impending night, I chose to love this place. But if you still wish to break this egg at all costs, I shall become its sentinel, and I will reap you. Even if it means killing X by his own hand, Hakma will do anything to not be separated from the one man he's desperately attached to. He chose to love this hell he's trapped in on his own, much like how he chose to love Ayn regardless of his wrongdoings towards him. Shortly after Hakma makes that threat, his core melts down, taking the form of a mass of spinning clocks bursting out from his old metal chassis. Manipulation of the TT2 protocol is now under Hakma's control. He won't let anyone, not even his own mentor, get in the way of his eternal life with Ayan. The first few lines read, Do we truly need to change? All of your loved ones are finally by your side now. And, We will not ever lose anyone as long as the cycle repeats. Hakma bargains with X, trying to convince him that he doesn't want to go forward, that he doesn't want to leave this place where everything is okay. In his second phase, he says, 
Why are you trying to let us slip away? I just wish to stay with you, everyone, and all that we have left in this eternal moment. And please do not steal away the last glimmer of what I treasure. X does not understand how deep the history runs between them. Nonetheless, X is the last person Hakma has left, the last glimmer of the person he loves. Letting X proceed would lead to them being separated forever. In the final phase, his last few sentences read, You never knew when to stop, so I shall stop you with absolute certainty this time. I do not understand. What more must you sacrifice? Just what are you trying to achieve? No, I do not wish to change. I do not want to forget at all. Please, let's just stay. And I just cannot understand. Neither then can I accept it. It's Hakma's last chance to stop X. He pleads with him, begs to him as he has done many times before. His greatest fear is about to come true, losing Ion. His meltdown ends with the words, You could move onward, in spite of everything. Hakma has returned to his regular self. He faces X with an air of shame. The weak and fragile chick that has just pecked its life out of an egg cannot hope to stand against this world, he says to him. I deemed you to be that chick, one that is too fragile to endure all of this. I have never known where it was you wanted to fly to, since you never told me. I was always nothing more than a student who needed your teachings. Hakma's doubts seem to be crushed alongside with his spirit. He's utterly defeated. You were always so frugal with words, he continues. I could have no idea what you exactly attempted to achieve by creating this prison. The process of creation was too harsh, I could not help but run away. I could have run far enough that I would never see you again, but I did not. I tried to set everything right, and I was caught. Since then, the iron hands that govern me have stopped permanently. In fact, I vaguely knew the end was nearing. However, I was simply too afraid to face the final outcome, and instead chose to stay here forever and ever. I may have been verbose with my reasons for attempting to stop you, but to be truthful, I did not want to part with you yet again. That was my biggest motivation. Nevertheless, I should support your decision. And in the last few words Hakma ever says to X that follow, I have always blindly followed behind you and stayed by your side, remember? May we embrace glory together, for back then we could not. Hakma is coming to terms with the fact that from this point on, he's lost Ion. He's lost X. But this relentless dedication to Ion comes back in full. He laughs at the fight he put up. He admits how afraid he was. He lists all these reasons why Hakma and Benjamin were in the wrong the entire time. His line of blindly following Ion is purely the truth now. The only thing he asks from X now is that they embrace the glory that's promised for them in the future, together. All he wants is to be important to Ion. Surely, if he demonstrated his willingness to follow his decisions now, it wouldn't be too late to mend his and Ion, or X's, relationship. However, this very dream, everything Benjamin ever wanted for Ion, everything they suffered for, was all about to come crashing down. Hakma's story isn't concluded until the ending of Library Ruina. For that to be addressed, we're going to take a detour all the way back to the beginnings of one particular machine, Angela. It's important to bring her up because of how important of a character she is and the interesting relationship she holds with Benjamin. From the very first moment Angela opens her eyes, Benjamin shields her from Ayn's wrath and is the first and only person to show Angela genuine kindness. It's only a machine, says Ian when Angela recognizes him from Carmen's memories, only to be pleaded by Benjamin to calm down. Angela asks what she did wrong. Benjamin is the one to answer her, saying, Please understand, Angela. He's not ready yet, that's all. He just needs a little more time. Benjamin then proceeds to answer any questions that Angela asks, a polar opposite from her creator which looks upon her in disgust. When Angela asks what her work will entail, Benjamin apologizes. Why are you apologizing to me? Angela sincerely asks, only to be answered with, I just feel like we've done terrible things to you and that person. Benjamin sympathizes with Angela early on, not disregarding her as a machine unlike her creator. His attitude towards Angela is shaped by his disapproval of Ayn's actions. He does not want yet another unfortunate soul to be caught up in Ayn's actions, so he does what he can to stave off the damage his mentor causes. Once again, Benjamin is not a blind follower. He's conscious of Ayn's evil, which is why he does not want the innocent to be brought into this. It is a burden Benjamin wants to carry alone. Nevertheless, he still can't leave Ayn's side. 
Freeing Angela and interfering with the script would be directly disobeying Ayn's will, so the least he can do is treat her with kindness in hopes it would amount to something. However, the very same Angela that Benjamin held pity for burns the entire plan to the ground. Benjamin's dream is destroyed when Angela chooses to steal the light for herself. The plan was his entire life's work. It's why he practically sacrificed himself to Ayn, because it would be all worth it in the end. But he would never see the ending he wanted to see. He's helpless. Angela is Ayn's creation, and so, Angela seems to inherit Ayn's scorn and disgust for those around her as if it were generational. When she forces the other Sephira, besides Binna, into a stalemate, holding the light hostage, Hakma is furious. But ultimately, he can do very little. Angela knows she has the upper hand, so she offers a compromise, offering the Sephira a second chance at life, rather than to be permanently shut down as the end of the script promised. Hakma is against this, as seen in Hod's third episode. He wanted it to be over. There was no reason for him to keep living. His dream was gone forever. However, Angela is not so merciful. In Netzak's third episode, we see the stalemate come to an end. Angela does not terminate those who want to be terminated, promising them that they will be revived. However, before she lays everyone to their temporary rest, Hakma shares his last words. I shall become a sentinel once more and watch over your every action. It's an interesting callback to his exchange with X before his core meltdown. Hakma has always acted as a sentinel, once to protect his selfish wishes, and now to protect what remains of Ions. When Hakma is finally awoken, he is clearly defeated, treating Roland with anger and bitterness. I have no obligation to treat you ilk with any courtesy or greeting, he says in his first episode. Any faith I would have has long been crushed. This episode gives us further insight of Hakma's attitude towards the library, when he later says, I dedicated my entire life to fulfilling the wish of a single person, only to be filled in by Roland, saying, and Angela stomped that wish, got it. Plus, you probably loathe me as well since I'm her full-time assistant. He does not answer Roland's claims, as they are the truth. Hakma did not wish to be forced into this new role, but now, he can only stand back and watch how it will unfold. In Hakma's third episode, he talks to Angela personally. However, despite everything she's done to him, she's not met with senseless anger. Instead, he talks about how Angela refers to him as Benjamin, asking if that title holds any meaning as to who he is now. Angela notices his lack of anger, proceeding to ask if he had a change of heart. Hakma responds with, Having sent my great and dear beacon away into the pillar of light, and having failed to give a proper closure to his ultimate plan, all I have left now is ferocity. The personality and characteristics of our previous selves still constitute us. However, those are but molds we were cast in. That mold is now being filled with our everyday experience in this place. Hakma later criticizes the library itself, saying, the library is no different from Elcorp. The fact that your way of managing this place is nearly identical to how it used to operate speaks volumes. When Angela tries to defend her actions, saying it was the only thing she learned how to do for thousands of years, Hakma merely responds, You earnestly desire to escape from the past, yet you struggle to break free, much like me. Hakma makes the connection that Angela and himself aren't so different, and he's correct. The two have more in common than they might think. They've both been wronged by Ayn in many ways, but the similarities end with how they reacted. Angela highlights this difference when she brings up Ayn himself in their conversation. He brought you lot back from death without consent and forced you to endure cycles of pain. You were nothing more than puppets to him, dancing on the stage as he liked. I was born from more of his irresponsible actions too. How can you accept all this as if it were nothing, Hakma? Hakma takes a moment to respond, then says, it is no longer a matter of whether or not his actions are acceptable. I simply chose to accept it. I am not one to judge my mentor's will. This is the first time Hakma directly addresses his role as Ayn's accomplice, and how he finally accepted his circumstances, alluding to his defeat after his meltdown back in Elcorp. However, this only infuriates Angela. Both you and Ayn are completely insane, she says. You have to be. You're not the Benjamin I used to know. Benjamin, he... He was the only person who cared enough to tell me it's okay, even though I'm not human. Here, despite their complete opposite views, Angela confesses that she saw Benjamin as a source of comfort, and Hakma, although but not Benjamin, shares her sentiment. You would be right, he says. The one who stands before you right now is Hakma, not Benjamin. And yet, Angela, I am not so different from Benjamin in that I do not believe your status of humanity is what matters. The conversation ends when Angela refuses to talk with him further, telling him to go back to sorting books. She does not want to open herself up more than she already has. In those few sentences, Angela showed how she truly still does care for Benjamin, no matter if he's Hakma or not. 
In the thousands of years of hell she's endured, she has seemed to treasure the kindness Benjamin showed her all those years ago. We see their relationship explored further in the subsequent episode, after Angela returns and asks Kokomo what he thinks of the library and exchanges her feelings on running it, until the topic shifts to her belief in the one true book. Things that have lost their reason to exist because people no longer believe in them shall disappear, Hakma says. You, however, remain strong. You believed in Sir Ian just like I did, and even when your faith was betrayed, you sought to start anew on your own two feet. Perhaps your wish wasn't limited to freeing yourself. You may have want all of us, librarians and even abnormalities, to lead their own lives rather than bind themselves to a role on an artificial stage so that they can live in true independence without putting their lives in the hands of Carmen, Ian, or anyone else. After this is said, Angela finally asks the one question that has been up in the air since they first talked. You're being gracious towards me after all that's happened? She's met with a response. It's up to you to interpret it. Ironic, is it not? Sir Ian and I irresponsibly created you and gave you life, and now you are irresponsibly trying to give life into our hands. Although not completely forgiving Angela, there's grounds to believe that Hakma does not see Angela as a mere villain and recognizes her as deeply troubled. Yet, Angela is still suspicious of Hakma. Say what you want, but you're still going to stop me. She seems to expect a reply along the lines of defending Ian, but instead, Hakma says, That depends on your decision. Until then, I shall trust you and wait patiently. Faith has been the guiding principle of Benjamin and Hakma's lives. At first, it was completely snuffed out. Now, he chooses to place his newfound faith in Angela that she will do the right thing. It's why he doesn't blindly lash out at her in the first place. He trusts the chance that Angela would have a change of heart. He does not completely give up. He has hope. The third time the two meet in Hakma's fifth episode, Angela asks Hakma if he knows how the invitation to the library works, referencing how Ayn and Benjamin were once the all-knowing orchestrators of Elcorp. At first, Hakma does not answer Angela, and only points out the irony of how she once shunned him. However, when Angela threatens to leave, he agrees to answer her, saying that it's invention made possible by the guidance of one person, Carmen. Angela asks him if he's saying that she can't escape from Carmen, and Hakma replies, Haven't you realized by now? You are a copy of Carmen, yet you can never be the same being as her. Angela is frustrated by this, saying she wants to escape from her ascendancy, but is hesitant, saying, I'll be completely and absolutely alone if she leaves my side. Hakma responds with, you may still have certain others willing to keep company with you even after you have shaken off Carmen's grasp. And when Angela asks who, he answers, that we do not know. Although a vague answer, Hakma hints that everyone's willingness to be by her side, including his, would be decided by the choice she would eventually have to make in regards to the light. He has hope, but he simply chooses to wait and see what Angela would decide in the end. She further gives Hakma hope when immediately after he answers her, Angela brings up the fact that she wanted to erase every librarian after the script was concluded. However, she claims that Carmen stopped her, saying that she told her not to kill the others. Hakma is not phased by this, saying, Angela, do you truly think Carmen is responsible for stopping you? I believe otherwise. It is by your own will that the lives of the librarians and the guests are being retained. Despite everything Angela has done to him, Hakma believes in Angela's change of heart. He's patient with her outbursts of anger, as he knows it's justifiable given the atrocities she's gone through. In a way, it's the only manner Benjamin can atone for Ian's countless sins against her, through treating their creation with kindness. When Angela has another flashback to her past in Elcorp, it's unlike her previous meltdowns. Beforehand, they were out of anger towards Ian and the script, but now, she's afraid and vulnerable to the only one who understands best what she's gone through. I was always alone, from the beginning to the end. It was foolish of me to believe that anyone would stay around. You lot and I, we were just exploited and ditched. Such was the script. Later, sadly, after numerous repeats, my innocent mind had already worn out and gone cold. We couldn't build any kind of relationship in the first place. Angela wasn't originally made this way, and Hakma knows this the best out of everyone. She didn't want to be left alone when she stole the light for herself, which is why the librarians kept their lives in the first place. The first thing Angela says to Hakma after she laments on her past is, I'm afraid, she continues, saying, If I embrace all of my past and lift it off my chest, what will be left of me? Up until now, my entire existence was based on my past sufferings. The long, cherished yearning for revenge is what led me here. But if I were to accept everything I went through as history, then what would I be? Maybe I'll end up being reduced to nothing. The things I want to know and the reason I want to keep living, it's all about vengeance. I'm scared I might lose the meaning in my life. 
that's why I'm too afraid to accept the past. In a way, Hakma and Angela aren't so different in that the past has defined their identity for far too long. It haunts them. Choices that they could have made differently, people they could have saved, disasters they could have avoided. Yet, Hakma seems to have found peace with himself and knows Angela's struggle all too well. So he responds to her with his own advice. You must accept the death of the past and reinvigorate yourself as you head towards the future so that you can live on, he says. No matter what conflicts, agonies, and regrets you may face in that process, you have to grow onward while facing the future and be born again. I had been chained to the past for far too long until this knowledge came to me. You may find yourself confused at the moment, but you will understand soon enough. They share a bond of having gone through similar agonies, although for complete opposite reasons. Despite this, Hakma cares for Angela. He wants to see her heal from the wounds the past has left on her. It's why he's done everything he has up to this point, talking with her honestly, answering her questions, and giving her personal advice. Hakma has had very few in his life, both in his current and past, that he treats with such care. But this relationship he slowly mends with Angela shows that he sees something in her that others do not, the potential to be a good person. When Angela returns to herself after her meltdown, she's upset. Hakma responds to this with, I understand, yet I do not. It is unlikely for one's thoughts and interests to perfectly coincide with another's. That may be the reason my mentor, I, and the rest of us ultimately failed. Even now, he reminisces on the past, wondering what could have led him to this mess. When Angela comments on this, asking why Hakma was being so compliant when she'd ruined his plan, he answers her, saying, could it be that our faiths and translations did overlap for once? The Sephirot may be helping you despite regaining their memories, perhaps because of that. Angela responds in frustration at the aspect of everyone taking pity on her. Yet, Hakma sees this differently. One could call it that, he says. To elaborate on this matter in my own words, I believe each of us is understanding you for different reasons. It helped that we could feel a glimpse of your pain when we were in the light. Angela is not yet convinced, but Hakma is firm on his words. Angela, I am of the belief that sympathy and love are no different from each other. At the end of the day, sympathy motivates one to understand the circumstances of others and reach out to them to make their lives better. How can I not acknowledge it as a form of love? Hakma loves Angela, the last living reminder of his mentor's legacy, the machine he irresponsibly helped give life to, holds a dear place in Hakma's heart. From the day of her metaphorical birth to the day Hakma rescued her from her ego-manifested state, he's harbored this sort of fatherly bond for the machine she helped create, even after the countless things she's done to wrong him. He's the only one who sees the kindness in his heart, forcibly snuffed out by Ayn's script, now slowly rekindling as she becomes her own person. He continues, saying, And besides, don't you have sympathy yourself, Angela? You sought at the end of your endeavor to give freedom to all of us who are chained in this cycle. Angela tries to diminish his claim, saying, As much as I still envy and hate you to death, we do share a history of being subject to manipulation. Think of it as a small side benefit I happen to be able to grant. In response to this, Hakma smiles, almost teasing her, saying, You still are awfully dishonest. He sees through the cold farce Angela has put up almost instinctively to protect herself, to not share her true feelings. Angela does not argue with him, saying only a few words with a smile, Thank you. There's a silent reconciliation between the two of them. They bear similar scars from the past and share unique agonies that they once had to suffer through alone. Yet now, with the delicate bond they once shared mended, they could begin to heal little by little. Nonetheless, one of the most heavy burdens Hakma bore was his failure to complete his mentor's plan. In the end, the light was in Angela's hands and there was nothing he could do to change that fact. However, he still held hope. This hope manifested itself into the smallest of actions, such as treating Angela with patience, tending to the small spark of kindness he saw growing in her. He never forced her to talk with him, or argued for her to change her mind. He only held his belief in Angela that she would do the right thing, and waited. And then, when Angela is on the cusp of achieving humanity, the dream she held for thousands of years, she comes to a realization. You, I, and this library are soaked in the blood of many, she tells Roland after a hard-fought battle. All the actions I took in pursuit of freedom only sped the treadwheel. I convinced myself that it was an inevitable sacrifice I had to put up with, for the sake of my freedom and amends for my agony. And once this was over, I wanted to stop taking precious things from anyone. The precious things she talks about are not only about people's lives, but Ian, Benjamin, and Carmen's dream. She stole it away. 
but now she wants to undo what she's done. And so, she releases the light. All the pain and suffering, all the agonies endured in the facility, all the people Benjamin lost, all the people Hakma watched suffer. After all this time, their work had finally come to fruition. While in the light, Angela reminisces on this. Now I understand what you lot meant when you wished you could be there to see the fruit of your labors. Although Ayn and Carmen have both passed, a piece of Benjamin lives on in Hakma. He gets to see the fruit of his labors. And although this point in the story involves very little of the patron librarians, I'd like to think that this was the peace and closure Hakma needed. Everything was worth it. It was all for something. Benjamin, now Hakma, the last researcher who breathed life into this project, can finally rest. Benjamin is a very interesting and complex character that people like to reduce to one trait. However, this undermines the role he plays in the story and the choices he made that influenced it. In both his lives, he witnessed and went through a multitude of mental trials, yet not once collapsed or crumbled. He stayed true to himself and his beliefs throughout the entire story, never succumbing to unreasonable or selfish desires. Because of this, more people should appreciate his character and the love and care that was put into writing him. Although unlikely, I do hope for more appearances of him in the future, no matter how big or small. And even so, if Library of Ruina is the last time we see Benjamin or Hakma, I do hope more people come around to appreciating him as a character. Although, hopefully people do so in a more of a normal way, and less of a making an unnecessarily long video essay type of way. Speaking of, if you made it this far somehow, I thank you for giving me the time of day to explain the lore of this guy in its entirety. If there's something you should take away from this video, it's this. Project Moonriders are incredibly talented, and I am incredibly bad at choosing productive things to do in my free time.